And at this time, it's my pleasure to begin introducing our plenary speakers to you. We have four persons who will be speaking for 12 minutes each. Our first speaker is Reverend Karen Hutt. And Karen is the Associate Supervisor at the University of Minnesota Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's a board certified chaplain and is ordained within the Unitarian Universalist Association. Please welcome Reverend Karen Hutt. So I'm going to run Karen's questions for her now that I'm an expert at this. So again, I'm going to open polling. There we go. Now the question is, do you use play, games, and other simulations in your curriculum? If you do, press A. If you do not, press B. All right. Going, going, going. I'm going to close it off in one, two, three. So closing it. All right. 69% of you do not do, do, and 30% of you do not. That's very good. All right. So the next question. <laughs> for those of you who said yes, for those 69%, only for the yes people who say they use it, how often during your unit do you use play, games, or simulation? So I'm going to open the polling, all right? A is rarely, B is a couple of times, and C is regularly. All right, we're going to stop the polling. Stopping the polling now. Hold on just a second. So 21% said rarely, 56 said a couple times, and the rest said regularly. Great. That's very interesting. All right, Karen, it's all yours. Now, let's see what all of this might mean for CPE in the 21st century. Clinical pastoral education continues to change. It is responding to shifts in our student population which are increasingly made up of retiring boomers, international transplants, hipster millennials, and questioning evangelicals. CPE is flexing with the demographic and mood changes about religion in our culture, crowdsourcing to find a church, Facebook pastoral care, spiritual but not religious, more and more people checking boxes in the hospital census that says no religion. CPE is adapting. It is being offered in new settings, new venues, often in partnership with trans and multidisciplinary teams whose work surrounds and overlaps the framework of our discipline. CPE in outpatient clinics, CPE in rehab centers, CPE in prisons, and in creative partnerships with community-based organizations and churches. CPE is also attracting new practitioners, as we see here today, who understand themselves as facilitators, as conduits, as guides. Some are bringing multi-phrenic postmodern theories to, that lack fixed values and religiously inspired identities. These supervisors tend to define themselves in relation to the multiple and conflicting directions in which are, which are being simultaneously drawn by both social media, media and cultural relativism. <clears throat> Religious humanism, God as creativity, choice theory, possible selves theory, are pushing up against more traditional theories. Because of these changes, we might even consider, for a moment, reframing 
those three precious words that have defined us. Let's say we got rid of the word clinical, which is culturally framed by the observable, the analytical, the taxonomic, and the treatable. And instead, we use the word experimental, which is framed by cognitive guesswork, embodiment, physicality, and mutable variables. Let's say we got rid of the word pastoral, which is religiously framed <laughs> by Christian shepherds and sheep that diligently march to the path of traditional religiosity, and we began using the words post-religious, which is framed by humanistic value options, relativism, and self-acceptance, and even spiritual syncretism. And finally, let's say we took the word education, which for many still means dispensing of knowledge from the supervisor to the trainee, from the teacher to the pupil, and replaced it with the word construction, which is framed by elastic realities, negotiation, and the building of new structures that can hold multiple ideas, emotions, and spiritual imaginations. If we did that, CPE would be East PC, experimental post-religious constructivism. <laughs> now, many of us have already begun to navigate and react and respond to this evolutionary pressure and inevitability of massive social change with new approaches, new theories, and frameworks. Yet given the diversity of experience, education, social location, and the varying levels of enthusiasm that students bring to CPE, we could and should do more to build stronger, more imaginative and creative activities and experiences for our students. One way I have done this is to create an affective EPC curriculum that assists students in maximizing multiple entry points into social interaction, emotional commitments, and modes of expression. I've created a foundational model of five pillars of a curriculum that includes practical tools. This part of the curriculum develops the student's skills and behaviors needed to be thoughtful, productive, and empathic caregivers. Faith in family. This includes philosophical and theological grounding coupled with conceptual challenges to, their, to the student's tradition, and defining and learning the why, what, and how of biological and chosen family. Creating community, here we create a covenant for creative learning, emotional potential, growth, and flourishing. Wisdom building, in this part of the curriculum, students develop abilities to use multiple lenses to see, feel, and guess the nurturing of a sense of proportion and introspection and respect for the uncertainties of life. <clears throat> Me, myself, and I, this means students get to claim their personhood in all of its forms and exploring multiple self-strategies that resist modernist integration. Each of these five pillars is resourced by games, readings, challenges, surprises, exercises, and simulations that are designed through the conscious use of metaphors. Now, in Metaphors We Live By, George Lakoff, who is a linguist, and Mark Johnson, a philosopher, suggest that metaphors are not just poetic devices making our thoughts and language more vivid and interesting, 
but that they actually structure our perceptions and understanding. Conceptual metaphors are often used to understand theories and models in pastoral care as well. These metaphors are prevalent in our communication and we do not just use them in language, we actually perceive and act in accordance with these metaphors. Now, given the improvisational nature of our discipline and the multitude of metaphors we use in describing spiritual care, metaphors can give students an opportunity to embody their conceptual responses to scenarios that might occur with themselves, among their peers, and with patients and families. For the past three years, I have been taking my students to Circus Steam, a circus arts program in Chicago, where there with the staff, I have been developing a program of circus as metaphor for CPE. <laughs> These circus activities challenge preconceptions of what can be, what is possible, and serve as metaphors for how flexible we might need to be with our theology, our personhood, and our approach to learning. It is the perfect metaphor for those early days in a unit where students are often stuck in the mud of their previous knowledge and dispositions about what they can and can't do with the challenges of our learning centers. As a facilitator for student learning at the circus and at my center, I am the scene shifter, unobtrusively changing the decor, moving the furniture around, setting up apparatus so that students can explore environments with the many intelligences that Howard Gardner pushed me personally to use in a previous lifetime. Throughout the summer unit, the spotlight is on the students. Sometimes they're on the high wire with no safety net below them. Sometimes they are dancing back and forth between being open and being hidden, between power and humility, between being needed and needing. Visiting a patient in distress can take as much courage as rolling back and forth with another in a cyclical wheel. Standing before peers, sharing a deep part of your personal life, your personal story can take as much trust as it takes to walk across the taut, tight, strong rope. Learning how to assemble clues to provide the appropriate intervention takes as much skill as juggling scarves in the air. Circus learning provides an affective stage for our outcomes, which include personal freedom, spontaneity, risk-taking, critique, conflict resolution, modifications, strategies, and hope. The circus activities remove students, if only temporarily, from the weariness of the group circle to embody concepts and outcomes that have been previously left only to didactics. Circus learning creates moments when the supervisor and students are all stunned, surprised, or seduced by a crisis, fear, resistance, revelation, shock, or surprise. Circus games tack into that part of our brains and hearts that say yes, no, both and, try, give up. Students can be agile, adaptive, and amusing circus performers. They perform risky and intangible things in front of one another without an agenda or a checklist. 
in one of the wheel exercises, students had to talk about theological rubs they experienced in providing pastoral care while at different positions in the wheel. In one of the clowning skits, students had only seconds to respond to a pesky sidekick while maintaining their composure, which reminded many of an overnight in the ED. In a game of lemonade, students posture, recoil, and boast with one another. We form, norm, storm, and adjourn as we chase one or another around the room in a complex game of emotional tag. For students, circus learning is about bringing clinical nuances into action and creating an embodied opportunity that liberates emotion, intensifies enthusiasm, and provides fodder for deep intellectual discernment. I would like to think that Anton Boyson would have liked to participate in an EPC CPE circus. He wrote, in times of crisis, when the person's fate is hanging in the balance, we are likely to think and feel intensely regarding the things that mattered most, end quote. Students feel intensely in circus steam about the here and now. What is hanging in the balance for them may be fear, anxiety, mistrust, anger, joy, or rage. Feelings that will often help them develop their own metaphors as caregivers. In order for us to create agile, self-aware, confident, thoughtfully imaginative learning chaplains, we must invest in the design and the development of new environments for learning and learning in a constructive environment that takes place outside of the seminar room and in the bountiful world of metaphors. Thank you.